no, this is my home. You know, it's like wherever my stuff is, wherever my mm -hmm. dogs are, that's that's my right. home. And, it feels and if, like you, home. if your husband's there too, that's fine. <laughs> yeah, that, that helps. <laughs> Are you an RV person or are you just RV life curious, wondering how people live in a tiny space with their family 24 seven? Either way, this is a podcast for you. My name is Kate White and I travel full time with my family and two kids and the dog in an RV. Every week I sit down either with a fellow RV woman to discuss why she chose RV life and how she has changed on the road or with a special guest who speaks on a topic relevant to travel life. Pull a chair up to the fire and let's chat. Hello, Desiree, and welcome to the RV Queens podcast. Where in the world are you these days? Hi, Kate. Thanks so much for having me. I'm delighted to finally speak with you in person. I've been watching and enjoying your shows, so I'm looking forward to our chat. Um, I'm currently in uh, southeast Florida, just below, south, uh, below Palm Beach. Oh, nice. Is it pretty hot down there? That's where our home base is. Okay. It is, but it's quite breezy. So it's actually, at the moment, it's really nice. The temperatures are just perfect. It's nice to go out for a walk. It's not too hot. It's not too yeah. cold. It's, it's just right. It's that time in it. Florida where it's just right. <laughs> Man, I bet Good you guys have some here. great sunsets down there too. I always think that. <laughs> yeah, that we region. do. We, and yeah, there's often a lot of color in it. Like You get some low cloud in the evening and it really lights up orange and purple. And yeah. It's very, Ooh. we live on a golf course, so you get really nice you know, skies over the, over the greens and yeah, it looks mm -hmm. nice. And Oof, like that's the best. I love that about Florida. You have had some epic travels and I'm really excited to ask. I have a lot of questions for you. Not only have you RV'd literally all over the United States, but you have also written two books about it and you have two more like in the works. Four but more. Four more? Oh my gosh! Yes, amazing. Um, okay, there's, so there's that much to see in the United States. It needs that many books. It's like the more you <laughs> see, the more you realize there is to see. It's crazy. Oh. Before RVing, though, you guys lived in a boat, and before that, you had an epic career, both in the U.S. and in Europe, as an economic policy advisor for the United Nations and World Bank and all these, you know, corporations. So there's a lot to unpack in your story, especially for someone like me that's like insatiably curious. But I actually want to start by asking back um, when you and your husband decided to slow your life down, you actually almost died twice. What happened? For me, what happened was that I had a massive double-sided pulmonary embolism and uh, ended up in hospital and they said well you're an hour from death uh, we were actually on an island we were in the san juan island so i was evacuated by plane to a hospital on the mainland and um and then subsequently i had complications so that when i was back in new york um so that was the second time and uh, my husband had cancer um which isn't what was trying to kill him it was the uh botched surgeries and the uh, oh, no. yeah, failing medical care in a very famous hospital in Washington, D.C. So you oh, just no. never know. But, yeah, it hit us both twice. And, you know, the, the message comes home hard. Like, okay, we get it. <laughs> it's time for a change. So you guys decided to slow your life mm -hmm. down and actually sail on your boat around the East Coast for a long time? Yeah. How did you know what you were doing? I just have to ask, like, had you ever... Were you living in it long term? How did you know how to like live in a boat? So we had never, never had a boat, but we lived in New York and we thought it'd be nice to have a home in the, in the country, upstate New York. So we were searching for homes and it was that time where, you know, there had been a housing crash, but people who were selling their homes weren't you know, integrating the fact that prices had come down and it was just a nightmare, you know, it was a nightmare trying to find a house. And one night we said, why don't we just buy a boat? And we're like, okay, well, where do you go? We'd never boated, never owned a boat. Uh, we ended up going, we were actually in the process of moving to Washington, D.C. at that point. Uh, I was working at the World Bank. So Jonathan came with me to D.C. one week and he went to a marina and he called me and he said, oh, there's a boat for sale here. Do you want to come look at it? And I said, sure. 
and we went to see it and we bought it. And that's how it went. <laughs> that's how we always do things. So we bought the boat. Um, the insurance company made us take lessons because it was a 40-foot boat. Uh, so they made us take captain's lessons. I was actually the captain of our, our boats always. And uh, we liked it so much, we sold it and bought another one after six weeks. Uh, and then fairly quickly after that, we bought actually two other ones. So the one we ended up with the longest was a 60 foot boat. And, uh, we spent similar to what we do in the RV. We spent about eight months of the year in it. So we would go up and down the East coast and in the winter, go to the Bahamas and uh, just work from the boat. Oh my gosh. Okay. So, so when you buy a boat, they make you take lessons, but when you buy an RV, no one cares. <laughs> <laughs> well, so this is actually interesting because when you, you can buy a smaller boat with, you know, extremely powerful engines and that you don't have to take any lessons, like you can literally throw the money on the counter and, and leave with the boat without any lessons. Um, but these boats, because they're, you know, much bigger and heavier and have a lot of power, then the insurance company steps in. If you want it insured, then you have to take lessons and, you know, sort of do a captain's certificate. Not really, but... Um, yeah, you have to know what you're doing when it's that big, basically. Oh, my gosh. I love it. And also, I love that you were the captain of the boat. <laughs> yeah, the yeah it's funny because, you know, in a lot of places, people were very surprised when they saw it was me at the helm. And, you know, this, there was this place in the Bahamas. They always recognized me. Like, oh, you're back. Yeah, it was oh. a lot of fun. And a lot of the guys were like, oh, is, you know, is this going to go okay? And But I've I've never, ever hit anything, and I've seen a lot of guys hit a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you know. We could talk on that topic for a long time. <laughs> yes. But I'm going to keep <laughs> us moving. So you, get, so you end up in Florida around 2020, and everything changed when COVID hit, obviously. How did you yeah. guys end up in an RV? Totally by accident. We... So we never spent the summer at home because we were always away on the boat. Um, and when COVID hit, that was the first summer we were at home. We were like, we don't want to do that. Florida is not very nice in the summer. We don't want to spend another summer at home. Mm -hmm. um, and we wanted to change from a power boat to a sailboat. So we had sold our boat literally just as, as COVID hit. And then, you know, a lot of people didn't know where they could go. Marinas were closed. There was so much confusion. We're like, well, we're not going to. You know, we're not going to buy another boat right now. Um, but then hurricane season came around and, you know, we're home in Florida now. We had four dogs and at the time also three rabbits. And we oh thought, well, we, we need a way to evacuate, you know, in a COVID safe way with, with all the animals. So, well, I guess we should buy an RV. And uh, I think before that, honestly, you couldn't have paid me to get on an RV. It, like, mm -hmm. it never even occurred to me, yep. you know, anything to do with RVing. I don't think I'd ever been in an RV. Uh, but so we decided to buy one. But the problem was that just about everybody else in the United States had the same idea. And <laughs> there were no RVs anywhere. And uh, we would phone around, you know, all the dealerships. And like, the RVs were already sold before they even hit the lot. Um, and then finally, one dealership in uh, Jacksonville, Florida, called us and he said, oh, I have one coming in. It's not sold yet. Do you want it? And we're like, fine, we'll take it. And uh, it was a 17-foot travel trailer. Oh, my and, gosh. Um, yeah, they delivered it to the house, actually. And uh, we're like, well, how does this work? <laughs> and so I Googled something like, you know, how to hook up an RV or something. And uh, KYD's video popped up, you mm -hmm. know, the RV for newbies or wh whatever the video was called. And uh, we started watching their videos and, you know, and they suggest other things you might like. And there were all these travel videos and um, like, oh, that's kind of nice. You know, a road trip sounds like a nice, nice idea. There's so many people doing it. Let's do it. So we took it on a, you know, a small test run first to make sure everything was working. And then we went on the road trip. And before we knew it, we'd spent eight months on the road. And uh, had been to 27 states on the eastern side of the United States. And I'm like, wow. This is nice. Yeah. yeah. And so we did stop at the uh, Hershey RV show along the way to order another RV. So we now have mm -hmm. um, a Super C, something okay. a little bigger for everybody. Yeah. yeah. 
But yeah, so it was completely accidental. It wasn't pl- just like with the boat. It wasn't planned. It just happened. And we liked it. And, you know, we always go full in basically on, on everything we do and decided to go explore the country. Why not? We're right. not, we're not like, I'm from Europe. I'm from the Netherlands. Jonathan is from the UK. Um, he actually recently became American. So, so that was nice. <laughs> um, but yeah, so it was great to go see so many places, you know, both places that were iconic, especially to foreigners, you know, there's so many places that from being a child and seeing things on television, it's like, oh, the United States, you know, there are things that are just so representative of it, Mm -hmm. you know, and then also a whole bunch of other things that, you know, you discover along the way and hidden gems and, oh my goodness, there's so much to see and there's some in the national parks and everything. It's just incredible. This country has so much. Yeah, I agree. And even growing up here, I'm like, I didn't realize how much there is until we started traveling full time. Yeah. (laughs) Well, it's funny because now like there's so many like American friends that we have and they're like, oh, we have never been there. We've never Mm -hmm. been there. Or what's that? Never heard of it. So yeah, it's nice. Um, so actually, I, that's one of the things I hope my books will do as well, like for people to discover, you know, places they've never heard of, they've never seen, never considered going, maybe a state that they, you know, never considered going to see. And it turns out there's a whole bunch of nice things for pretty sure. much everywhere you go. Yeah. And that actually yeah. leads me to, I was about to ask, at what point did you decide to write a book and photo, like decide to publish your photos of your travels? Yeah. Well, I always took a lot of photos because my father was elderly and he lived in the Netherlands. And so our our main way of communicating was for me to post pictures of, you know, where we were or what we were doing. And then with the time difference, he would get up in the morning, you know, and he would see the pictures that I posted. And then, you know, that's kind of how we kept up to date with what was going on in our life and what we were doing, where we were. Uh, sometimes if I didn't post something, he would call and he's like, is everything okay? There's, there's no pictures. Um, he just passed away last last November, actually. I always took a lot of pictures and I started posting. When we started traveling, um, the sort of the road trip, uh, I started posting little bits, you know, this is what this is, and a little bit of background information. And then more people, you know, got interested and I got quite a bit of feedback. And I started writing more, posting on Instagram. And, uh, you know, people were saying, oh, why don't you write a book? And then I thought, yeah, why hmm. not? Why don't I write a book? Yeah. And, uh, and so that's when I started thinking about, you know, what that would look like or what I would want it to look like and what I would want to do with it and achieve with it. So that's how the idea gra- sort of gradually came along. That's beautiful. And, you know, I think there's like a nugget of wisdom in there because I've heard, I I can't remember who I heard this from, but you know, when people want to write a book or want to be a speaker or, you know, whatever, even if they want to start a social media channel or being a content creator, I've heard that the best way to focus in and really like find your voice is to pretend that you're speaking to one person. Like think of one person in your mind that you want to talk to. So I kind of love that it started off with you posting and writing um, descriptions of where you were for your father. Uh, And then it kind of like grew from there. (laughs) I think that's really beautiful. I was glad that my father was able to see the print proofs of the books just before he passed. Like literally the day before he passed away, I received the print proofs. So obviously I was here and he was in the Netherlands. So I recorded a video, you know, of me flicking through the books and my sister was able to show that to him. So um, that meant a lot that he was able to see it. Unfortunately, he was never able to hold a copy of the book, but at least he, you know, he saw that it came, it came to life. That's so sweet. So I have a question, and it might be a dumb question, and I also hope it's not offensive. There's no but- dumb questions. <laughs> you know, that's what people say, but no, just kidding. Uh, you are originally from the Netherlands, as you said. I'm curious why you titled your book about traveling the U.S., the long way home. I've lived in different places and I think wherever I lived was usually my home. Um, but the long way, we t- so I called it the long way home because every time we were going somewhere, you know, we, we never went home. We're like, oh, that's interesting. Let's go there too. And oh, that's nice. Let, let's do that too. 
And then there was a song, um, it's called, what's it called? I think it's called Running in Circles or something like that by Sonny Cleveland. And in the lyrics, it says, let's just take the long way home. And I really like the song. And it's like, that, you know, the long way home is basically what we do. We're always taking another detour to go see something else before we go home. So that's why I call it the long way home. Because wherever you are, you're home. Right? Yeah. Especially and with that, your... That's, yeah. It always amuses me because people always say, you know, when we're traveling, don't you miss your home? And I was like, no, this is my home. You know, it's like wherever my stuff is, wherever my mm -hmm. dogs are, that's that's my right. home. And, it and feels if, you, like home. if your husband's there too, that's fine. <laughs> yeah, that, that helps. <laughs> oh, it's so funny you said my stuff and my dogs. <laughs> well it's you know kind of included in the game yeah, yeah and he and he's there too as an accessory yeah <laughs> that's right yeah <laughs> okay so I have a ton of questions about your travels so I thought I would ask them kind of in a rapid fire set of questions sure. so I could actually you know get them asked in a timely manner okay mm -hmm. so have to this is probably everyone's first question for you but what is your favorite state of the lower 48 that you've been to? The dreaded question. <laughs> um, it's such a difficult, you know, it's such a difficult question to answer. And I think, you know, it's always like a cheating thing. Well, it depends. So, you know, there's, there's, for example, Florida is great in the winter. Uh, it's hard to beat Florida in the winter, but you know, I really like this year. Well, 2023, we went to Oregon for the first time and it was such a revelation. We absolutely loved the Oregon coast. It was so beautiful. So I think that would probably be my favorite state for the summer and South Dakota too, by the way, that was the same thing. Like I had no idea what to expect in South Dakota and it, it was just such a big surprise and revelation that, you know, I'd, that seems like a really nice, but again, that's not really a nice place in the winter. I hate the cold and I don't mm -hmm. like snow. And so um, and then like North Carolina, I really like the coast and the mountains and those are really nice in like fall and spring. So I think I would have to cheat and say, it depends on the time of year, <laughs> what my favorite state is. That's those fair. Were, those were totally that is totally fair. Okay. Well, I wonder if that's going to be your same answer for the next question. What is your least favorite state? I don't want to upset anybody. <laughs> But I think um, the least favorite one that we've had so far was Indiana. Oh my gosh, I was um, going to say Indiana. Oh yeah. <laughs> I, I feel the same way, except for there's one gem that has a special place in our hearts, in our family, and it's Santa Claus, Indiana. I don't know if you oh. visited there. No, I don't think so. I mean, it's a small town. It's one of those you like, what do they say? You blink and you pass it or something like that. But they have a campground there. It's the Lake Rudolph Sun Outdoors, and oh my gosh, it's the best. And it's right next to an amusement park called Holiday World, which is fantastic. Um, but that's that's pretty much the only part of Indiana that we have enjoyed. <laughs> well, you know, and I always think, well, maybe it's just that I haven't been to, you know, the nice place or whatever yet. And, you know, because I think you can always find something nice everywhere and and like you say sometimes it just depends like the location this campground that you went to was really nice and you had a good vibe from it and you enjoyed your time there so you know it sometimes it's just dependent on that as well if you're if you're in a nice place or you're with nice people like it gives you a great vibe and you know you'd leave you leave the state with a much better impression but yeah if i had to pick one that would be the one for now until until i find something amazing there too <laughs> right which is also ironic because rvs are manufactured in indiana and <laughs> i know it's like oh, i hope i'm not upsetting anybody <laughs> i'm sure none of the manufacturers are listening to this podcast it's fine um uh, <laughs> okay so what is the most touristy cringy tourist trap of a place that you've been to i want to say there's three that I thought would be total tourist traps, but I actually love them. And I have lived in a lot of places that are very, I lived in New York, I lived in Paris. So I lived in a lot of places that are touristy and I actually kind of liked it because I always thought, well, it's touristy for a reason, right? Mm -hmm. So the ones that we've been to that were 
that were kind of like that were Niagara Falls, Graceland, and uh, Mount Rushmore. And with all three of them, I I was a little bit, you know, worried that maybe it was just going to be a tourist trap or you've already seen it in so many images. Like, is it, you know, what's it going to be like to be there in person? And for each one of those, we absolutely loved it. And like, I would even go back and do it again. You know, oh, like wow. we really enjoyed each of these, each of these places. Yeah. So that was surprising to me, actually. I don't know. I think those, I think those are the, like the real tourist places that come, come to my mind. Yeah. I think those are the main tourist places that we, we've been to. I mean, obviously there's other places that are very touristy as well. Most of the national parks, you know, if you go at the wrong time, you can barely move around. Um, but you know, I wouldn't consider them tourist traps. What about you? What are what's the tourist trap that you've been to that made you cringe? Well, Pigeon Forge, but man, I was just not prepared. I think part of it is like you said, like I had built it up in my head, and then I got there and I was like, oh, this is what's going on here. Uh -huh. It's just like everything cost a bajillion dollars and everything's fake and everything's just, it was hard to find even like a local coffee shop, you know, or right. like anything that felt real and authentic. It's like, no, yeah. lots of chains, lots of even like chain tourist thing, you know, like Ripley's. Yes. I've never seen more Ripley's whatever. Than yeah. <laughs> But it's part. funny you say that because I had never heard of, uh, this was the first year we were traveling. I had never heard of Pigeon Forge, like literally never. Okay. And we were driving over, um, we were staying in Townsend to go to the Smoky Mountains. And uh, we came over from North Carolina. So, you know, you drive through the beautiful countryside mm -hmm. and mountains and it's all green. And, and we arrived in Pigeon Forge, literally never having heard of it. And all of a sudden I'm like, that's an upside what down house. Yeah. Like, what? What? That's a Titanic. Oh, there's like a big gorilla. Where are we? What is this place? Like, I felt like it was like the Vegas Strip in you know in the middle of nowhere. And of course, then I started looking. Oh, what's Pigeon Forge? Oh, okay. And I yeah, Pigeon Forge is special, but it did inspire us to go to Dollywood. And. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm not a theme park person, but I love Dollywood. Yeah. Um, so yeah, again, you know, we found something nice there too. But yeah, That's right. it was a huge surprise. I'd never heard of it. Drove into it not knowing where the heck we were. I was like, yeah, wow. The Smoky Mountains are definitely the redeeming factor, in my opinion. And we were there in October, so I mean, the scenery was just like beautiful, yeah, the full colors. So, yeah. Like you, Smoky like you're Mountains saying, was a bit of a tourist attraction though it's the biggest the oh, most yeah. visited national park yeah and we made the mistake of of like you know going on a hike on a what saturday afternoon in october and we sat in traffic yeah. for two hours on the way there and two hours on the way back yeah. so but the hike we took no was parking. super epic right we had to park like half a mile well i should say my husband had to park like a mile away <laughs> 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 walked over to where we were oh yeah. man so i think like what you're alluding to is like your attitude is everything you know if you're always if oh, you're looking yeah. for the good then you'll find it no matter where you are yeah i think a lot of it is about expectations and i think sometimes you just have such high expectations that even if it's nice you can feel like a little disappointed whereas if you go in you know with low expectations or no if you can no expectations even better uh, and just like let it happen to you and, and discover it as you go. Um, yeah, I think a lot of it is about your attitude and your expectations wh wherever you go. And that actually makes me think of um, ev even just our family's RV life journey so far. We're only a year and a half in here, but um, we had no expectations. We thought we were just going to like, it's like retired people and trailer parks, you know? And then man, so many beautiful places. It's endless. And also the, the caliber of people that you meet on the road, uh, it's just like blowing us away. Like what? So many, and so many different people. backgrounds. It's like yeah. people you would have never met otherwise, you know, and mm -hmm. now you just get to hang out and chat with them. Right. And, 
I think that's amazing. I know. Like you, for example, right now. (laughs) (laughs) Oh my goodness. I'm interrupting my own rapid fire set of questions. Okay. Let me get back on track here. Um, (laughs) What place has made you feel the greatest sense of awe? Wow, you ask difficult questions. (laughs) Um, Yellowstone, some of the natural features that Yellowstone has, it's just so unique. You see it nowhere else. Just to see, you know, Grand Prismatic, if you go to that viewpoint and you look down on it and you see those bright colors and and the geysers and these fields where there's like steam popping out of the ground everywhere, it's, yeah, it's definitely awe-inspiring. Or Bryce Canyon and you see the the sun come up over the hudos in the amphitheater, it's yeah, it's amazing. Like, and, and, and again, it's so unique. Like, there's a lot of different things you can see in Europe, but, you know, you don't find that in Europe. It's just so unique. Glacier, like we did some of the hikes, um, like to Avalanche Lake and Hidden Lake. And the scenery, like it really takes your breath. And the, the, the glaciers, obviously, it takes your breath away. The, I think the, the natural beauty is just absolutely amazing. And on a different, like it's not the same kind of, Oh, but like we did Route 66 last year. And Route 66 is one of those iconic, you know, the ultimate American road trip that I think most foreigners actually definitely aspire to, probably even more than than Americans. And you meet so many like foreigners on, on Route 66. But it was something that had been such a big thing in my head. And even though it's like it's not one thing, the whole of Route 66 was a really amazing and moving experience. And it's, it's definitely one of the highlights of, you know, our track. And it's not necessarily to do with one particular thing or, you know, one thing of natural beauty or whatever, but the whole experience of doing the whole route from, you know, one end to the other. We did it from Chicago to Santa Monica. And everything you meet along the way, the people you meet along the way, both the locals and also all the other people who are traveling the road, and all the roadsides, you know, attractions and all the Americana, but also this, you know, really rich and important history of, you know, the economic migrants who traveled west, you know, not knowing where they were going, but in search of a better life. And yeah, it was really an amazing experience. Completely different from, you know, all the beauty and everything, but yeah. Yeah, Very you're good. you're inspiring me here. I didn't even really have that on our list, but now I'm thinking maybe we need to make that one happen. <laughs> well, you know, we were on day two and we're like, oh, we have to do it again. And we're only on day two of it. So and now we've decided we want to do it again in both directions because you know things look different when you see them from a different angle. So definitely want to do it. It's the centennial coming up actually in 2026 is the centennial of Route 66. And the, the other thing is that you know, a lot of it is disappearing because a lot of the iconic places along the road, you know, the service stations and the restaurants and whatever, all the famous stuff, they're basically all mom and pop shops. And, you know, these people are getting older. Many of them told us, like, our kids don't want to take over from us. And, you know, there's nobody taking over from them. These places are just going to disappear. And there's also a lot of places where you just saw Like economically, they couldn't survive. And, you know, there's a lot of places that are deteriorating and slowly disappearing. Some of them have already disappeared. You do see some renewal. There's a few new, uh, like, roadside attractions that that are being added. So that was really nice to see. And, you know, and just just recently, there's a new museum that opened, American Giants, and it has all, you know, the muffler men and and that kind of stuff. So, but yeah, I I wish it was like on more people's radar screen like americans because i feel like a lot of people take it for granted like oh yeah it's this this iconic thing from in the movies it's there and it's just always going to be there but it won't be like you, people need to be intentional about preserving it and 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 keeping it and keeping it alive because otherwise it will it will disappear and i think that would be such a shame you're right that's such an interesting perspective um and especially coming from someone that's not american you're totally right as i've you know it's always been there we i lived in missouri growing up and so i think doesn't route 66 cross through there at some point uh yes a small part yeah <laughs> I, it's just like well yeah like whatever it's route 66 but you're totally right if we aren't 
proactive about it. It'll just be one of those things that kind of fades into the background and yeah. no one yeah. care of it. It would be sad. Yes. Um, yeah. Wow. I love that. What are the places that you really connected with that you want to go back to again? You know, that's funny because like every time, well, not every time, a lot of time we go places and like, oh, we should, you know, we'd really like to come back here sometime. But the list of places, so the list of places we wanted to see keeps getting longer because, you know, you talk to people, you find out about new things or, you know, on Instagram or YouTube or whatever. So that list keeps getting longer. And then we have this list of all the places we want to go back to sometime, you know, and that gets longer and longer. So it's kind of hard, but yeah, you know, well, the Oregon coast was an obvious one. It's like, I have to, I have to go back there. It's so beautiful. And like, there's such a nice vibe there. And, you know, it'd be nice to spend some more time there and not always being on the move and just maybe, you know, have some time to discover more of local life, you know, what that would be like. Um, and that's pretty much true for all the places that I said earlier, you know, like my favorite states. But then there's also, you know, just a lot of places that we visited and we enjoyed. Like I said, you know, um, Niagara Falls and Graceland and, and Mount Rushmore, we've done it. But I definitely go back and do it again, you know, or, or like from a different angle or, you know, maybe, you know, if you saw something from land the next time, see it from the water or, you know, go paddling somewhere if that's something that's applicable or, or whatever. But then there's also a few places that we've been to and we're like, well, that's nice. And, you know, I'm very glad I saw it, but I don't need to see it again. But honestly, that's less frequent than the ones we're like, oh, we should come back sometime. I have to ask you, have you been to Northwest Michigan? Northwest Mi Well, we went to the Upper Peninsula. Petoskey and Traverse City oh, yeah. and all of that. Yes. Man. Yeah, we went to all of that as well. Yeah. Okay. So that was one of the first things that got us on the road because... Um, there's a tulip festival in Holland, Michigan. Oh, and yes. we're like, well, we're definitely not, yeah. We we're like, well, we're definitely not going to make it to the Netherlands this year because it was COVID and we couldn't travel. Uh, so, we're like, well, the closest thing we're going to see, you know, that looks like tulips and a windmill is going to be Holland, Michigan. So, that was one of the, like, one of the big things that we started planning the road trip around. It's like, when is the tulip festival in, in, uh, in Michigan and, and let's go there. And uh, we'd never been to uh, Lake Michigan. So, you know, we did all those places along the shore of Lake Michigan and Mackinac Island. And then we did go also to the Upper Peninsula. Absolutely loved the Upper Peninsula. Um, another place that we definitely want to go back to sometime. Uh, so, yeah, we've been there too. Well, I ask you that because that's a place that's, I mean, we've seen a lot so far. Not as much as you, but... That's one place. Like, I still have the weather app on, you know, I have a little Petoskey you should, tab. You should get this book. <laughs> As we this all should. Whole, the, yeah, you should all should. But this one has the whole um, trip that we did in Michigan. So, the first, like, the first trip that year, 2021, the most, the states that we spent the most time in were Michigan and Maine. And then I think we ended up actually also spending a lot of time in, in, um, in North Carolina. But this one has like all the places that you just mentioned um, in Northwest Michigan, around Lake Michigan, um, Mackinac Island, Detroit, and, and the Upper Peninsula, all the places we went to there. It's amazing. It's another one of those, oh, wow, places, definitely. Yeah. When is your book that includes the Oregon coast? Which one is that? And when's that coming out? That'll be not this year, but next year. So um, the book that I'm working on right now that'll come out later in the year is our trip that we did of the Midwest and mountain states. And then the, the one that comes out the year after that, we did the Kentucky Bourbon Trail, which was really fun too. And Route 66, and then the Western States, and a whole and a whole bunch of other stuff. Like we went, we went and checked off a bunch of things that we weren't able to include the first time. Uh, actually, both in 2022 and 2023, we went to the Bloom Fiesta. So there's some stuff about the Bloom Fiesta as well. Uh, but so yeah, the Oregon coast will come out next year. Dang, I was hoping it was like this month because <laughs> we're <laughs> we're planning to head that way at some point this year. Um, so we'll see, yeah. but okay. So for someone who's just starting out with traveling the U S what place do you tell them like is a must see? 
it's kind of it's difficult because it really depends on what kind of places you enjoy and what kind of activities you enjoy like do you want to be around people do you want to be away from people do you like the hot the cold you know do you like going for hikes so it's, i mean i tell people what i think but like when i know what like what their preferences are or what they enjoy because there's just so much that you know you should start with the kinds of things i guess that you that you enjoy and then sort of venture out of your comfort zone a little bit more and and try different things yeah but yeah i i think it really depends on on what you like back to your book um like anyone who is creating something new i'm sure you've had moments while you were traveling and writing uh where you felt overwhelmed like why did i do this to myself why did i commit to writing this you know is anyone going to care about this um how do you overcome those moments I did feel a bit like I was doing another PhD at times. It's like, okay, right now it feels like work. You know, it doesn't feel like fun. It feels like I'm working. Um, but yeah, sort of like e lean into it. You know, there's days that you're going to feel like that. That's fine. And then you just pick yourself up the next day and, you know, you discover, you know, you're about to write about this amazing thing you saw and, you know, people will react to it. And I, you know, like, I would get even on my Facebook, on my uh, Instagram posts, because uh, like a lot of what I put in the books, I, I like try out on Instagram and I see what people react to. And sometimes like from the feedback I get, I change what I want to write about because there's things that I thought that were interesting and people connect more with another aspect of, you know, whatever it is that, that I was posting about. But um, yeah, people will just say like, oh, you know, I'm so glad you posted this because it brings back all these memories I had from this trip I went on with my parents or, you know, or I used to live there and it makes me want to go back. And when, or like, oh, I've, I'd never heard of this. I'm, you know, I'm so excited. I want to go see it. So that kind of gives you renewed energy <laughs> to sort of, you know, plow on with it because it is a lot, a lot of work. And actually I'm finding out now as well, like, okay, so now the books are published and I was like, okay, I'm writing a book and, you know, it's out and okay. But now it turns out like, you know, you have to actually do a whole bunch of stuff um, after the book is published and, you know, like try and promote it and everything. And that's completely out of my comfort zone. Like I'm, that's not my personality at all. And uh, even like with the pictures, when I post pictures, I never post a picture of me. Like I'll, I'll include pictures of the dogs or of my husband as like, who wants to see a picture of me? Like, why am I posting a video? You can see this amazing waterfall or whatever. You know, why post a picture of me? And there's actually several people on Instagram who, who were kind of like pushing me. They're like, no, you should put a picture of yourself. Like, it's really nice to see, you know, it's more personal. And I was like, no, oh, okay. Maybe, maybe <laughs> post a picture of me. <laughs> you know? But yeah, people always assume because you post a lot online or, you, you know, you spend a lot of time online that, like your life is out there, but you know, it's only that part that you're putting out there that's there. And so I'm, I'm usually not in it. You'll notice I'm usually not in anything that, that I post. I did notice that when I was researching for this episode. And when I found videos of you, uh, you know, doing interviews or whatever around the interview or internet, I thought her voice is so beautiful. Like I love your accent and you just have this oh, kind you. sweetness you know and i i thought to myself she should do more like voiceovers or something on instagram even if uh -huh. it's not your face uh i think you just have a really lovely voice so take that oh, for a, take it or leave it but I there's my two cringe friends. like i hate i hate hearing myself and like yeah. oh my accent, like, I don't really hear my accent much when I talk, but when I hear myself, I hear the accent. Like, oh. <laughs> uh, I love it. I think it's refre refreshing. So there's my two cents. Well, you know, it's different. And, you know, one of the things that's nice about the United States is that there's so many accents, even within the United States, that, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's just another accent, I guess. It's just because you're foreign, I guess you kind of feel like it's different or you, or it stands out more, but... Honestly, mm -hmm. there's people who speak English and I'm not really sure what they say sometimes, right. you know, it's like <laughs> my ear really needs to adjust to whatever the accent is. It's like, just, uh, there's so many accents here. Boy, anyway, yeah. so. Yes. My husband is the worst 
at that. He's if we go to an area where people have a really thick accent, I have to be his translator. He's like, I really can't understand what they're saying. And my my husband's the same. Like I can't understand, and I kind of look at him like, what what did he say? Like it's so embarrassing. Or if I think. Okay, I think I know what he said, and then I answer, and it's like completely right. not what they asked. And it's so embarrassing. <laughs> like, oh yeah. I wonder Sorry. if Google Translate has like a, you know, a dialect. <laughs> it's still yeah. English, but I just mean. Yeah. Or even sometimes it's the intonation. Like you, you really have to adjust to like how they're speaking, and you know, some people it's really easy, and others just like, well, it doesn't like it doesn't want to enter you know okay so i have a couple of questions uh before i have you share how people can connect with you online whenever you think back to desiree before rv life and and really like back before sailing life and when you were still working your career when you think of desiree then and now what has changed back in the day you know there's a culture where you have to be always busy if you don't if you don't look busy or you're not busy then you're not important you know especially the the places I worked you had to be traveling all the time if you weren't traveling you know you weren't important and you know meetings 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 always meetings 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 having coffees with people and you know having lunches with people and oh my god and um yeah I think just that all of that is just not important and even like the the um, the reports I worked on or the research I did, you know, I completely stepped away from it. And back then, like that was the all consuming, most important thing, you know, and it like, it seemed like it was groundbreaking and, you know, we're going to have all these insights and, you know, it was so important and, you know, we're going to do this and that. And I stepped away and then like, I look back now and it's like, it really hasn't moved on much, you know, it's like, why, why kill yourself doing it? Because, you know, things move very slowly in, in that kind of space. So priorities have completely changed. Um, a lot of things that, you know, I used to think were very important. I don't really think they're that important anymore. And, um, I think one of the, well, obviously I've become a travel writer, <laughs> which I wasn't before RV life. So that was a big change. But also just like to realize that it's important to be not always in a hurry for the next thing or, you know, the next destination or, you know, whatever the next thing is and to just be in the moment and enjoy, you know, where you are or who you're with or what you're doing and not always be looking forward to the next thing. Um, I think that's that's definitely changed a lot because even, you know, even on the road, you kind of find yourself sometimes like already thinking about the next thing and what you're going to do there. And, or, you know, now with the books, it's like, what content am I going to create there rather than actually be present, you know, in the moment where you are and, and just enjoy that. So I think, I think that's definitely one of the big things, but that whole culture of always being busy. And I think actually in the United States, that's even more important than, than in Europe. So there was a, a joke that we always talked about that, you know, in Europe, especially like the Mediterranean countries, they basically take all of August off. And, you know, if you send somebody an email, even towards the end of July, well, let's say mid-July, they're like, sorry, I'll be back in September, you know. And then the joke was always that, like, if you send Americans an email and you get an out of office, it'll be like, oh, I'm having a liver transplant, but I'll be back in the morning, you know. And it's like, of course, it's an exaggeration, but like, there's so much truth in that, you know. And I think that, growing up in Europe and these are all horrible generalizations, but I think, and I lived in France a long time where that's really important, like to really enjoy life. And like you work to enjoy life. You don't live to work that kind of attitude and just like enjoy good food and enjoy good conversations. And, you know, like time is valuable, but like for you as a person and not for your boss always. Um, and, you know, yeah, I think that's, that was, and that was also, of course, partly driven by, you know, what happened to us with our health scares. But RVing, I think, definitely contributed to that as well. It's really interesting to hear you talk about that as a European, because I thought it was just Americans that dealt with that hustle culture and busy, busy, busy. That's, you know, now it drives me crazy, but I definitely lived it for at least 10, what, 15, I don't know, a long time. And it was like the, the, it really was just chronic 
stress. And for me, like I, I threw like, I had a couple kids in there and, um, it's just when I think back to how nonstop my life was, I'm like, man, my poor body, <laughs> like it really takes a toll on your physical health. I, I don't mention it very often just because it never comes up, but I have lupus. It's a chronic illness. And I have found that since I stepped away from like the intense nonstop stress, I've been able to manage the, the condition so much better. I have way less flare ups. Now, if something happens that, you know, causes a lot of stress, if there's particular things you're dealing with or whatever, I can immediately feel it. Like I know I have a flare up of my lupus. So it really is a really stark reminder of how bad stress is for you and your body. And, you know, that's just not in the culture. You know, people are not raised to, you know, be aware, be aware of that. And actually, you know, you're kind of encouraged to embrace it because, yeah, like being stressed means you're busy and, you know, that means you're important or you're doing it right or, you know, um, it's a real mindset and a, something that you have to be very intentional about, I think. Be intentional about, you know, what you do with your time and, you know, when you go out exploring or, you know, whatever whatever it is that you choose to devote your time to. You don't get your time back. So, you know, it never comes back. So you have to spend it wisely. Right. <laughs> oh, I love it. Okay. The slogan for this show is a podcast about unexpected riches. And I'm curious to hear what is the unexpected richness that you have found from RV travel life? I think there's two. One is the kind of obvious one. It's like all the people you meet on the road, like this it's yeah. What comes from that talking to people everywhere, so many different backgrounds, people you would have never met otherwise, you know, that's just amazing. And like, you don't find that easily in any other way. We had it a little bit with the boat as well, but that, and actually that brings me to the other richness. I think just the sheer flexibility that you get from RVing, you can literally decide at any point in time, I want to go there and you pack up and you go. And there's basically no restrictions on where you can go other than, okay, you know, it's the United States, Canada, or Mexico, basically. But, you know, it's unlimited within, within that giant territory. It's unlimited. You can literally go anywhere you want. We had it a little bit on the boat, but you're tied to, you know, the locations on the coast. Whereas I find now with the RV, we can still go to all those places that we went to by boat. But you can't go by boat to most of the places, you know, that you can go to by RV. And just that flexibility and the, you know, the richness of the of the choice you have in front of you, like where you get, it's, it's even a little overwhelming. Like you have to really break it down and, you know, sort of figure out, you know, what's important, what you want to do first and where you want to go next. And like we were saying, you know, that list is just growing, growing, growing. So, yeah, I think that's definitely the... The, the ultimate flexibility that you have when, and I like it when people complain, you know, I see people complain online. It's like, you got wheels, leave. Like you don't like it, leave, just leave. You're not happy here. Just keep, keep the train moving. <laughs> Amazing. So what is next for you and, and the Beagles and Jonathan? Well, um, we have our head, our itinerary planned out completely booked, you know, reservations made, Ferry reservations made. We were going to go up the East Coast to Canada and do Atlantic Canada, Nova Scotia, Newfoundland, Prince Edward Island, uh, Quebec, Montreal, Toronto, all those places. Um, but I have literally, just before the podcast, I heard that um, I'm going to be doing a very exciting project. I can't share it just yet. Hopefully, I'll be able to share it soon. And it basically means that we're scrapping the itinerary completely and, uh, and starting over. So... Hopefully, I'll be able to share soon what that what that's going to entail. That it's is be a so lot of exciting. Let me guess. Does yeah. it start with an N and write, rhyme with Netflix? <laughs> Just kidding. You know how to answer no. that. <laughs> <laughs> like, where are you going with that? Uh, no. <laughs> what rhymes with Netflix? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, it's it's about another it's about another book. Okay. That's um, awesome. Yeah, I'm happy for you. Exciting. Okay. Well, 
please tell us where can we find your book online and also where can we just connect with you on the internet? So I post on Instagram as at RV Cruising and our website is thelongwayhometravels.com and there's information about the books there. There's also information there about, you know, the other trips that we've been on. There's a ton of pictures from, you know, each year that we traveled. There's pictures about the dogs and, you know, a little bit of information about the dogs and there's an interactive map as well. You can see, you know, all the places that we've been to. Um, and then the books. So I just wanted to show them. They're available on, um, this is part two. And that's part one. Uh, they're available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and Walmart. Yeah, and we'll put all those links in the show notes to make it easy for audience thank members. So, man, thank you so much for being on the show today and for sharing oh, your life. Oh, thanks for having me. It was so fun chatting with you. Yeah, and your book is beautiful. Well, hopefully I will see you on the road at some point. Yes, I hope our paths will cross somewhere. I what are your so plans well. for this year? Where well, you it? it's actually similar to the plans we had last year before our RV just did not want to work ever. So we're planning to go west up through South Dakota, kind of like you mentioned. Um, I think it would be super fun to be at Mount Rushmore by July 4th because I've heard they do mm. like a big to do there. So I'm just putting that out there that it's going to happen this year. <laughs> nice. Um, yeah. And then, you know go see some mountains and stuff uh itinerary to be determined because i'm not yeah the best at planning so go see some well, cool it's stuff part, out of the, west. part of the fun right like That's you right. you have a blank canvas and you can do whatever you want like, right the, it i is, think the trip planning is definitely part of the fun right it's overwhelming to me though because there is so much to see and we like to stay about two weeks at a spot uh, mm -hmm. so, you know, it's like, if we see everything, we're going to be there for about 20 years. Uh, and let's yeah. fit it into like six months. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, we've moved quite quickly because like we've been to all of the lower 48 now. So obviously we weren't able to spend as much time as we would have liked. Um, it really was a trade off, you know, trying to see as much as we can mm -hmm. be reasonable about it. Usually we try and stay maybe four or five days in, in a spot or sometimes park a bit longer and then just use the car to go and explore, you know, in the area. Yeah. But uh, having, yeah, having the luxury of staying somewhere like two weeks and really be able to take in, you know, the local culture a little bit more, that would definitely be nice mm -hmm. to have that opportunity. Yeah. But, yeah. It's a trade off. Right. Well, and we have young kids too. So I think the, the fast travel, I just think we would all fall apart pretty quickly. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's exhausting. Um, it, is. it is. Yeah, yeah. it is. Yeah. Oh man. Well, thank you so much, Desiree. I <gasps> loved this conversation. I loved having you on the podcast. And, it was uh, really fun talking to you. Thanks for having <laughs> me. Yeah. You're welcome. All right. Cheers. All right, my friends. Thank you so much for tuning in to today's episode and for being my favorite part of RV life. If you could please like and subscribe on whatever platform you're listening on, that would be awesome. And listen, if you want to have conversations like I had on this episode with your fellow RV women, head to rvqueenspodcast.com slash community and choose your RV Queen circle today. All right, guys, I'll see you next week or hopefully I will see you on the road. That's the best. <laughs>